week nine. We're going to call this video PowerPoint lecture chapter nine because it's a continuation of the chapter we started last time. And solutions is the topic, and we're going to continue where we left off last time. Um, as we usually do when we have face to face class, let's just quickly backtrack just a little bit to one of our last topics that we saw last time. And we're going to use this as a jumping point uh, as we move forward with solutions. So last time uh, we talked about ions in solution and electrolytes. And you saw last time that an electrolyte was a substance that produces ions. And because you have ions, it conducts electricity when they're dissolved in water. Remember, there were strong electrolytes, two types of electrolytes. One was the strong electrolyte. How did we define a strong electrolyte? It was a substance that ionizes completely when it's dissolved in water. The second type of electrolyte we learned was a weak electrolyte. Weak electrolytes are only partially ionized in water. And then we have the non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes are those substances that don't produce ions when they are dissolved in water. All right, so now that we refreshed our memory on the different types of electrolytes, let's take that and apply it to the body because that's the goal of the course. All right, so this slide's entitled Electrolytes in the Body. Electrolytes are, in fact, found in our bodies. What do they do? What's their function? They carry messages to and from the brain as electrical signals. Because remember, when we have electrolytes dissolved in water, they carry electricity, electrical charge. The electrolytes in the body maintain cellular function with or providing you have the correct concentrations of the electrolytes. So remember from last time, both sodium chloride and potassium bromide, they are ionic solids. And you learned last time when we talked about electrolytes that ionic solids such as sodium chloride and potassium bromide are strong electrolytes. Because they're strong electrolytes, let's refresh our memory as to what that means. Sodium chloride, when it is dissolved in water, the water is going to pull apart those sodium ions and those chloride ions. Remember the term we used last time. They're going to become hydrated. The water is going to totally surround the sodium ions. And how do we uh, write that? Well, we write the sodium ion okay, with that little AQ behind it, which means that that sodium ion is totally surrounded, hydrated uh, by the water molecules. And the chloride ions, the same thing. So chloride ions with the AQ behind it, meaning aqueous, aqueous means that chloride ion is totally surrounded by the water molecules, right? The different part of the water molecules, the hydrogens are pointing towards uh, the negative chloride ion because they are partially positively charged. Same thing happens with the potassium bromide because it is a, an ionic solid. When we dissolve it in water, 
So let's write our equation. Remember, you have to be able to do this. You're going to have to be able to recognize correct equations for the solvolysis of different uh, types of electrolytes. Okay, so these are strong electrolytes. Let's refresh our memory. Let's review. Remember, strong electrolytes totally dissociated. So a, a single arrow, the water over the arrow. Remember, this is entirely different from the way we write an equation for a weak electrolyte. Okay, so make sure that you go back and review. Okay, all right, so it is a strong electrolyte. What are we going to write on the other side? Well, we're going to have the potassium ion, and we're going to indicate that it is totally hydrated. Okay totally and we do that with the aq in parentheses aqueous and same thing happens with the bromide ion okay hundred percent dissociation all right all right so in the body let's move back to the body and the electrolytes in body fluids all right. We're going to introduce here two new terms, equivalence and milliequivalence. All right. So we reviewed how sodium chloride and potassium chloride dissociate 100% when they are dissolved in water. Let's imagine what's going to happen if we now combine the sodium chloride and the potassium chloride in water so they're in the same solution okay so let's bring in a beaker all right and remember what happened previous slide sodium chloride in water so there is our water you could see okay um, sodium chloride ionizes completely all right and it's hydrated by the water so we're going to have sodium ions. We no longer have the salt, right? And we're going to have chloride ions, all um, dissolved in the water. Same thing's going to happen with the potassium bromide. So we're going to have potassium ions, and we're going to have bromide ions. All right, so they're all mixed together in the same solution. So we're only sh showing one. Of course, there's many more of these in the solution, but you get the point. Okay. So, as we said, the cations and the anions are all mixed together. So an identical solution could just how well have been made if we started with potassium chloride, right? And sodium bromide the same thing would have happened with them they would have dissociated we would have gotten the same ions we would have had sodium ion chloride ion bromide ion potassium ion so really we can only speak about having a solution with four different ions in it since the solution is going to be the same regardless of who our starting ionic solids were. Well, in the body, a similar situation exists for blood and other body fluids, which contain many different anions and cations. Since the anions and cations in our blood and the other body fluids are all mixed together, we don't know what they came from. It's difficult to talk about who the specific ionic compounds were from which they came. So instead, what we're interested in is only in those individual ions that we had in solution and the total numbers of positive and negative charges that result so we need a new term and that term is equivalence of ions 
When we talk about ions in the body, we talk about equivalence of ions, not the ionic compounds from which they can Equivalence. What is it? Definition. Equivalence is the amount of an electrolyte or an ion that provides one mole of electrical charge. That electrical charge can either be positive or it can be negative, right? All right, so let's give you an example of what we're talking about here. If we have one mole of sodium ions, we are talking about one equivalent. Right. Okay. One mole of, of sodium ions give us gives us one mole of positive electrical charge. So that's known as one equivalent. One mole of chloride ions. All right. So the electrical charge is negative. All right. Gives us one mole of electrical charge. So one mole of chloride ions is equal to one equivalent. All right, let's take calcium. Calcium is in group two of the periodic table, right? It's a metal, and so it carries a plus two charge. So one mole of calcium plus two is going to have um, two equivalents of electrical charge, right? Not one as we have here. It's going to have two equivalents. And let's see if you could fill in the blank here. Okay. All right. Going from what we talked about, one mole of sodium ion with a plus one charge is equal to one equivalent of electrical charge. One mole of chloride, right? One equivalent. Doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. Now we had one mole of calcium. Well, that's two equivalents. So how about one mole of iron plus three? Yep. Okay, you're correct. If you said three equivalents, you are a hundred percent correct. So again, let's review what we just talked about with that new term, the equivalent. One equivalent, which incidentally is um, abbreviated capital E, uh, lowercase q, of an ion. So if we're talking about one equivalent of an ion, again, it could be positive or negative charge, is an amount which in essence is equal to the molar mass of that ion divided by the number of its charges. Right. So one equivalent of any ion is going to be equal to the molar mass of that ion, right? One mole, right, in grams, uh, divided by the number of charges on that ion. Oftentimes we talk about the equivalent weight of an electrolyte. Which is exactly what was on the previous slide. It's the amount of an electrolyte in grams that carries one mole of charge. Right? The molar mass. Equivalent weight right, is equal to the grams, right, the molar mass, divided by one equivalent. Okay. Um, equivalent weight. Right, grams of the compound that has carries one equivalent of charge, right? So it's the molar mass, right? Divided by the number of equivalents in one mole. So let's let's do some calculations here just to show you how this equivalent weight thing works. All right. 
let's set up a table. So in your notes, you're going to set up a table with the number of equivalents, right? We did that on the first slide. We looked at ions and we figured out the number of equivalents. All right, then we're going to set up the molar mass of whatever that ion is divided by or over, right, the number of equivalents from here. Right, and that is going to give us the equivalent weight. All right, so let's let's do a few as an example. Okay, so let's take our good friend sodium from sodium chloride. Sodium ion. Okay, what is its charge? It's plus one. Okay, so uh, the number of equivalents. All right, that's one equivalent. All right. Uh, the molar mass of sodium from the periodic table, 23 grams, right, in one mole, right, then is, right, one equivalent, right, and when we divide these two, right, the equivalent weight is 23 grams per equivalent. Let's summarize. Notice. It's a relationship between two units, this equivalent weight thing. It's a relationship between grams, right, and number of equivalents. So this equivalent weight can be used as a conversion factor in problems. Okay, let's look at a problem, a sample problem, where, in fact, we use it. Okay. This is a very typical equivalent weight problem. Calculate the number of equivalents in 46 grams of sodium ions. We're going to use the equivalent weight and its definition as a conversion factor. So 46 grams of sodium is what we're given. But what do we know? We know that the equivalent weight of sodium, right, uh, 23 grams of sodium, one equivalent, okay? But conversion factor, we're going to flip it so that our units cancel. So grams of sodium ion is going to cancel. There it goes. And we're going to end up with equivalents, which is what we want. All right, so two equivalents of sodium ions. Okay. All right, so we defined what an equivalent was, but in medical work, uh, milli equivalents are used. So remember, milli is simply a prefix, right, um, that takes and changes the, um, the size of the unit, right? The, so one milli equivalent is equal to 0 0.001 equivalent, right? Milli um, makes it smaller, right? So one equivalent, another way to look at it is one equivalent, right? The equivalent is the larger unit. The milli equivalent is the smaller unit, right? It's a unit decreasing prefix, that milli. Okay, so one equivalent is equal to a thousand milli equivalents. This is probably the best thing to use, right? Very similar to one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters, okay? Whoops, whoa, don't like it when that happens, sorry. Okay, all right, so let's do another problem. Uh, the concentration of sodium is 138 milli equivalents per liter. How many moles of sodium ions is in one liter of blood? All right, so you, when the minute you see this term here, milli equivalents, all right, you are thinking the definition, okay, of equivalence. All right, so. Let's set it up. What are we given? Well, we're told that we have one uh, liter of blood. All right. And here we have 
a conversion factor. Whoops. It is relating milliequivalents to liters. Okay, so we can get rid of the liters by using the appropriate form. All right, 138 milliequivalents of sodium per liter of blood. So this cancels, our liter of blood cancels, and we're going to be left with milliequivalents. Okay, they want to know how many moles, remember moles is related to equivalents. So let's take our milliequivalents and convert it to equivalents. All right, what's the relationship? One equivalent, thousand milliequivalents, cancels, cancels. We're going to know now that we have 0 0.138 equivalents of sodium ions. All right, we're not there yet. Okay, we have to know how equivalence relates to moles. Okay, so we take that answer. Okay, and we know from our definition that in one mole of sodium ions, we have one equivalent of sodium. So equivalence cancels and we have moles. So it's super duper important, I've said this from day one, that when we introduce a definition, you have to have a handle on that definition. You have to master it. You have to know exactly what an equivalent is um, in order to be able to do problems. If you don't, you're gonna fall short. All right, so practice, practice, practice. Know the definition, understand it so you can apply it. Okay, let's move on in this chapter. Our next topic is solubility. So let's see, what do we have here? This first um, part of this slide. We see our, our water, we're well familiar with the Lewis structure of water. Um, and so let's just imagine that we have a beaker of water, which means we have multiple molecules of water in the same beaker. Let's just focus on two of them. We know that water is perfectly set up because it has hydrogens bonded to an electronegative oxygen, right? Each of them perfectly set up for that thing that we call hydrogen bonding. So we're showing here a hydrogen bond between the oxygen on the water, one water molecule, and the hydrogen. So remember, we've got this all over, all right? We're just showing one of them, okay? All right, let's take and expand upon this. Let's take um, and imagine that we now have added ethanol to our water. This is ethanol, CH3, okay, CH3, let's see. I can't write really good with these little things, but we're gonna try, okay, CH3, okay, blah, CH2, I wish I had a uh, something to write on my screen, but I don't. Okay, CH two O H. And so when you draw the Lewis structure of ethanol, all right. So this is the Lewis structure of ethanol right here. We see that we have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, very similar to the way we have one in water. The only difference is we've got this whole big carbon chain, right, rather than a hydrogen. So when we add the ethanol to water. It turns out that we can get hydrogen bonding between the water and the ethanol. Okay, this hydrogen bond here is identical to the one that we have between water. Okay, all right, let's expand this even further. Let's imagine now, so this was all a beaker of water. This is a beaker of water with ethanol in it. Let's imagine that we just had pure ethanol, okay, just pure ethanol. So you see um, an ethanol molecule here, and you see an ethanol molecule here. So let's, um, let's circle them so that you can actually pick them out, okay? So one ethanol, 
molecule to ethanol molecules. Okay, and okay, each of them has that OH. Again, very similar to water. The only difference is one of the hydrogens has been replaced with this huge, as we say, carbon chain, or well, a two carbon chain. Okay, same thing here. Um, each of these ethanol molecules still has an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, so perfectly set up for hydrogen bonding. And we get hydrogen bonding between molecules of ethanol in a sample of ethanol. Okay, so all of these have hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is hydrogen bonding, very uh, just the same. Okay, so where are we going to go with this? Well, as we saw as we went through each of these, the hydrogen bonding between the water and the ethanol, which is over here, right? Between our water alone, right here in the center, and here was the hydrogen bonding in ethanol alone, as we pointed out, is so similar that um, the two liquids, right, when we mix together water and ethanol, the two are, as we say, miscible. Miscible means mutually soluble in all proportions. And you may have heard that, to, that term used, okay? Um, so water and ethanol are miscible. They are mutually soluble in all proportions. Although water and ethanol are mutually soluble in all proportions, most substances are not. Most substances reach the limit of what we call a saturated solution. What's a saturated solution? It's one that contains the maximum amount of dissolved solute. Solubility is another term that we talk about. What is the solubility of a certain compound? What do we mean when, when, when we talk about the solubility of something? It is the maximum amount of a solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent. That given amount of solvent, incidentally, is usually 100 grams. And when we talk about the solubility of something, it's always at a specified temperature um, in, the, in the laboratory or if you're working with something and they give you the solubility, there's often a temperature associated with it. So solubility is given in grams of solute per 100 grams of water. All right, so with that definition of solubility, the grams of solute per 100 grams of water, let's talk about the effect of temperature on solubility. It turns out that temperature often has a dramatic effect on solubility. The effect of temperature is different for every substance However, it is usually predictable um, and uh, is usually unpredictable. Sorry, let's, uh, let's backtrack there. Okay, so it has a dramatic effect and is usually unpredictable. Okay, solids that are more soluble at high temperature right, than at low temperature can sometimes form what we call supersaturated solutions. So we know what a saturated solution, saturated solution has the maximum amount, right, of solute. Supersaturated solutions contain even more solute than a saturated solution. And the only way you can do that is by increasing the temperature, okay? So when you make a supersaturated solution, these solutions are unstable. And typically, you get your solid precipitating out, falling out of solution, even when you just add a very teeny tiny seed crystal. Or sometimes you just have to, to pick up the container and put it down um, and 
and in a super saturated solution all of the crystals could start coming out of um, solution that's called precipitation okay so next slide still talking about the effect of temperature on solubility all right what do we have here well we have two graphs okay and the first one okay what we're seeing here um, in a this is a here all right uh, is giving us the solubility of some solids okay here's uh, glucose here is sodium nitrate here's potassium bromide copper uh, two sulfate here's sodium chloride uh, copper three sulfate okay down here at, at the bottom all right and our bottom graph b is the solubility of some gases in water as a function of temperature okay so temp temperatures here okay solubility there on the y-axis okay and if you take a, a moment and, and look at these graphs you note that if we're looking at A with the solids, most of these solid substances, all right, are trending up, right, in terms of their solubility uh, with increasing temperature. So that's um, a general rule. Most solid substances become more soluble as the temperature rises. We can't say all because some of them are not, but most. On the other hand, let's look at B, okay, graph B down here, which gives us um, the solubility of some gases as in water as a function of temperature. And what do we see? We see the exact opposite. The solubility of gases decreases as the temperature rises, okay? Carbon dioxide, right, as the temperature rises, look at it decrease, okay? Xenon, oxygen, nitrogen, pretty much the same thing so the general rule is the solubility of gases decreases as the temperature rises um, this explains a very common phenomena all right how many of you have poured yourself a glass of soda okay nice and bubbly because carbon dioxide has been dissolved in the sugary solution okay and you put it on the counter right it was nice and cold coming out of the refrigerator you put it on the counter and then you come back to it you get you sort of get sidetracked studying your chemistry right for several hours you come back and say oh forgot about my soda and is it as bubbly as it was when you originally poured it no okay because the solubility of that carbon dioxide right decreases as the temperature rises while it is sitting on the counter Okay. All right. It's time to start talking about some units of concentration. And we need to give you some definitions before we start our discussion of units of concentration. So solute, we need to know what it a solute is and we have to have a firm grasp on it when we talk about a solute that is the substance that is dissolved in a liquid because we're talking about liquid solutions here right remember at the very beginning we said yes there's other kinds of solutions but we're focusing on um, we're focusing on liquid solutions so solute is the substance that's dissolved in a liquid all right again liquid solutions okay uh, the solvent then is the liquid in which the substance is dissolved and when we talk about a solution then that is the combination of the solute and the solvent all right so we need to have these definitions down pat because as we look at the different units of concentration and give you equations, mathematical equations for determining units of concentration, we're going to use these terms. Okay. All right. 
So let's start with the very first unit of concentration, which is a super useful, very common way of expressing concentration in the laboratory. It is molarity. Molarity, which is abbreviated with a capital M. Again, I'm going to remind people, all right, um, when you're writing things out, okay, um, and if you're one of those who writes everything in capital letters or lowercase letters, you have got to break that habit. Okay. All right. So what is molarity? Molarity is defined as the number of moles of solute. Okay. Solute is the substance dissolved in a liquid. Okay. You need to know that so that in a problem you can pick out what you need. Okay. And so it's the number of moles of solute dissolved per liter of solution. Okay. So the mathematical equation for molarity, molarity, capital M, is equal to the moles of solute per liters of solution. Let's start a practice problem dealing with molarity. Let's work through it. What is the molarity of a solution that contains 50.0 grams of vitamin B1 hydrochloride? Vitamin B1 hydrochloride, look at that, they're giving you the molar mass. All right, so. Um, as we move forward, remember I said we're, we're not going back per se and asking you things on earlier chapters, but notice how chapter 7 material, right, moles, molar mass, is coming back, as well as those early uh, prefixes, okay? So the SI prefixes. So molar mass, 337 grams, all right, in 160 milliliters of solution. Right, so what are we trying to figure out? They want the molarity. So that's your red flag in the problem. That's telling you what you need to pull out of your memory banks, okay? And we know how to calculate molarity. We know the definition, the mathematical equation. So there it is, okay, that we pull out of the brain, okay, molarity is equal to moles of solute per liter of solution. If we want to calculate the molarity, we need to take the information in the problem and get the moles of solute and the liters of solution, okay. So we go back to the problem and we note, hmm, it's not giving me the moles of solute, but it is giving me the grams. And back in chapter 7, remember we learned how to go from grams to moles. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we need a conversion factor, and that conversion factor is the molar mass. So we have everything we need there to get the moles of solute. All right, so moles of solute is going to be our 50 grams. Right, and we pull in our molar mass conversion. Remember what molar mass is defined at the number of grams in one mole, right? So 50 grams times one mole divided by our 337 grams. What's going to go? Well, grams is going to cancel, right? And we're going to end up with moles. So I get, and again, I hope, listen, if I'm wrong on any of these, as you're, as you're, as you're listening to me, please send me a quick, um, a quick note that tells me, hey, wait, I think your calculation's wrong here. Okay, so moles, uh, 0 0.148 moles. Okay, so we have one piece that we need. Okay, notice I color-coded it. Okay. There's our red piece. All right, we still need liters of solution. What is it telling us? Well, it's giving us milliliters. Mm-hmm, okay. 
This is going back to one of our earlier chapters, right? Um, realizing that we need to convert, right, from the leaders to leaders. So we use a conversion factor, okay? Um, 160 milliliters uh, times one liter in a thousand milliliters or thousand milliliters and one liter, right? So milliliters will cancel because it's on the top and the bottom. And we end up with 0 0.160 liters. We have both parts, moles, right? There you go. And we have our liters. We're ready to plug things in. We can now calculate molarity. Here it is, 0.148 moles divided by 0 0.160 liters. And when you do this mathematical calculation, you should get 0.925 molar solution. All right. Notice this time I was very, very cognizant of moving things over on the other side so that things are not hidden under uh, my little picture there. Okay. Alrighty, moving on. I have for you another practice problem, okay? Because this is probably, I think, probably the most difficult uh, concentration unit. All right, it's the newest. All right, so next one. How many moles of solute are in 175 milliliters of a 0 0.35 molar? Oh boy, this is really cool. I love these. I love these types of problems. Sodium nitrate. You should be able to name this compound, right? That's an earlier chapter, all right? Sodium nitrate. So again, we're noticing. Notice what it's giving you. It's giving you the molarity. Again, you know the definition of molarity, okay? And that's going to be your jumping point. Molarity is equal to moles of solute per liter of solution. So in the first problem, we were calculating molarity, so we had to find these two things. In this one, notice we're given molarity, right? And they're asking for moles of solute. So it's just asking for something different, okay? There's three different variables in this equation. And each problem gives you different pieces. It gives you two or gives you the things to find two of them, and you're asked to calculate the third. Okay? So we have molarity, correct? We have milliliters, which we know we can convert. So we have these two, and we want to find this one right here. All right. So... Best thing to do is to come up with your equation. All right, so move things around. This is your little bit of math that you should have no problem doing. Okay, um, this is that that math that enabled you to get in the course. All right, so we're going to solve for the moles. All right, and moles then is going to be equal to all right. Your volume, right, in liters, right, your liters of solution, times your molarity, right? You're dividing by liters here. You're going to be bringing it on over and multiplying, okay? Now, remember, molarity has the units of moles per liter, okay? So when you have these two, right, when you have your volume in liters, you have your molarity, notice what's going to happen. You multiply them and liters will cancel and you're going to have your moles all right so let's see we've got to do some um some converting here all right of units volume we need it in liters we're giving it in milliliters 175 all right how do we convert again this one you should have uh the tip of your fingers right one liter in a thousand milliliters right so this is top bottom milliliters is going to cancel we're going to be left with liters all right so we got one part of our um, our equation okay 0.175 liters what else do we need here we need um, 
Well, we need moles. So I think we have everything. Yeah, we have the, the volume in liters. There we have it, 0.175 liters. And they're giving us the molarity. Remember, molarity is 0.35 moles per liter. So we have it right there. Okay. 0.35 moles per liter. Liters is going to cancel. And we're left with moles. Do your math. Plug it into your calculator. You should get 0 0.061 moles of your sodium nitrate. Okay. All right. I've got one more. Yeah. Practice problem number three. Okay. The concentration of cholesterol in blood is approximately 5.0 millimolar. Okay. Those prefixes can be put in front of molarity, right? So we call it millimolar. Uh, How many moles of cholesterol are in one liter of blood? Two-part question. And then how many grams? Okay. So this one's a much more in-depth problem. This is asking you to bring a lot of what you've learned through the course of the semester um, out of the memory banks and up front. Okay, but you know, take a deep breath when you're doing this. Don't get flustered and take it piece by piece. What do you know? Okay, what can you use? All right. So the first thing is, if we're going to be using the molarity equation, right? It is moles per liter, right? So we want to take what we're given and convert it into from, from this millimolarity into just plain old molarity, all right? So what does it mean, all right? It means that we have just like a particular molar solution, right? This is telling us we have 5.0 millimoles per liter of solution. Okay, we have 5.0 millimoles per liter of solution. Again, the goal is to convert it to moles per liter, which is molarity. So let's multiply it times our conversion factor. Right. One mole is a thousand millimoles. Millimoles is on the bottom. And where over here? It's on the top. So it's going to cancel. And we have converted milli, a millimolar solution into a molar solution, right? This is none other than molarity, right? Capital M. All right, there we go. Okay. All right, so that is part one, right? How many uh, how many moles, right, of cholesterol, right? There is point zero zero five zero. Right. How many grams? Okay, so I don't think I wrote it here, did I? Point zero. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Point, 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 point. Right. Zero. Zero. Huh. It is so hard to write with this. Zero. And it should be what M O L because right it's one liter of solution. Okay, all right. How many grams? All right, so that's bringing us back to chapter seven. We know how many moles. Um, we need to have the molar mass. Okay, so this one, uh, 386.7. They probably should have given that to you in here. All right, so I'm giving it to you. All right. The molar mass of cholesterol is 386.7 grams per one mole. And when you do your math, we find out that we have 1.93 grams of cholesterol in one liter of blood. Okay. Well, it turns out 
that those cholesterol levels that we just solved for in that last problem okay typically in medicine they're given in the units of milligrams of cholesterol per deciliter of blood so let's do some practice here let's do some unit conversion okay let's convert our answer which we had okay in grams per liter into milligrams per deciliter all right so we calculated on the previous slide right that in that one liter we had 1.93 grams okay so let's convert our grams to milligrams there are a thousand milligrams in one gram right grams is on the top right grams is on the bottom gone and gone so we're talking about 1.93 times 10 to the third milligrams right, of cholesterol. Now what we have to do is convert our liter right, into a deciliter. All right. Challenging. Okay. Deci, right? Unit what? Decreasing. So there's a lot of them. There's 10 deciliters in one liter. Right. Set up your conversion factor so that liters is on the top and the bottom, so they cancel. And we end up with 10 deciliters. Right. We have our two pieces. Let's put them together to get the appropriate medical use units, right? 1.93 times 10 to the third milligrams in 10 deciliters divide right and we find out that the cholesterol levels for that problem in the appropriate medical uh, units would be 193 milligrams per deciliter of blood okay so I'm giving you plenty of uh, practice problems here there's plenty more in the textbook right you've got to make sure that you practice All right moving on to our neck uh, next set of concentration units percent concentration um, there are three different types of percent concentrations uh, that you need to be familiar with and need to do problems with the first one is mass percent right and um, mass percent is um, percent m divided by m which is mass percent mass uh, divided by mass all right the second one and we'll see more about what these mean okay the second type of percent concentration uh, you need to be familiar with is mass volume percent okay so we call these percent mass uh, divided by volume and the third is volume percent percent volume divided by volume all right, let's take each one of them individually so you can see what we're talking about. We're going to start with that first one, mass percent. Mass percent is the ratio of mass units of solute to the mass units of solution. Okay, so remember we started out this topic with definitions, and I said you need to know the definitions. Okay, so mass percent, the ratio of mass units of solute to mass units of solution, expressed as a percent, which means times 100. Okay, all right, so let's give you an equation, mass percent, or percent m over m, all right, because we're talking about mass of solute, mass of solution, okay, is equal to the mass of your solute right that's the substance dissolved in the solvent divided by the mass of the solution remember the mass of the solution is going to be the solute and the solvent okay expressed as a percent so that means we're going to multiply times 100 so when you're doing problems involving mass percent Okay, you need to find the mass of the solute, the mass of the solution. As long as you have those, you're golden, right? And remember to multiply it 
times a hundred. All right, so um, easiest types of problems are those where you're given mass of the solute, mass of the solution, and you're simply calculating mass percent. Some problems um, are going to use the fact that this mass percent is a ratio between mass of the solute and mass of the solution. Since it's a ratio between two units, you can use the mass percent as a conversion factor. All right, so two types of problems. Very easy one, simple plug-in, okay? And a little bit more challenging where they give you the mass percent and you have to use it as a conversion factor. Okay. Second type of mass percent is weight or mass volume percent concentration. How are they abbreviated? How will you see it? You'll either see it as W, which is weight over volume percent or mass volume percent. This is the newer uh, way to designate it. You might see some textbooks or some problems. This is an older way. Okay. So mass volume percent. So mathematically, this, this weight or mass volume percent concentration is found by taking the number of grams of solute per milliliters of solution and then multiplying times 100. All right, so the abbreviation here, either WV, right, or MV, is really telling you what you're doing, and the percent is just telling you to multiply times 100. So a weight volume or a mass volume percent concentration, okay? What's it telling you? You have the weight or the mass, right, okay, of your solute in grams, so the mass of your solute in grams. Okay. The V is telling you a uh, volume, so we're going to divide by the volume of solution. And the units there are usually milliliters. Okay, And then you're going to multiply times 100. All right, let me give you an example. Okay, so physiological saline solution is a 0.90% sodium chloride solution. Which means 0 0.90 grams of sodium chloride dissolved and diluted to a total volume of a hundred milliliters. When you are given a mass volume percent, as we're given here, okay, this um, is oftentimes uh, has a parenthesis behind it where they'll say MV, all right, so you know that it's a mass volume, okay, or they might have WV behind it. Okay, that is telling you, okay, that you have 0.9 grams of that sodium chloride right, in uh, 100 milliliters. So again, that means you have a ratio. That means weight volume or mass volume percent can also be used as a conversion factor in problems. Okay, so for the physiological saline, if you're given physiological saline, you know it's 0.90% sodium chloride. What does that mean? It's 0.9 grams of sodium chloride per 100 milliliters, or it's 100 milliliters of um, solution, right, per 0 0.90 grams. All right. All right. Oops. I thought I went through and checked all these, but... As in our face-to-face -face lecture, sometimes things slip by. So what are we going to talk about here? Well, our third type of percent concentration. Right? 
which deals with dissolving one liquid in another. All right. So up to this point, the two that we've talked about um, had mass or, or, or weights, right, of the solute. What happens when we don't have a solid, right, solute? What if we have a liquid solute? We're dissolving one liquid in another. So we use volume, volume, percent concentration, okay, indicated by V divided by V percent, okay? Mathematically, Volume, volume, percent is determined from the volume of the solute, which is usually given in milliliters per milliliter solution. And again, it's a percent, so they're all multiplied times 100. So here it is. It came in a little bit early. All right, so volume divided by volume percent, right? Volume of your solute, what is it usually? Milliliters divided by your, your volume of your solution, okay? Per milliliter of solution multiplied. By 100. Let's do an example here. Very easy one. Um, what is the volume volume percent of a 75 milliliter solution made with 3.8 milliliters of methanol? All right, so we recognize immediately volume volume percent. We spit out right there. Here's the equation we're going to be using. Okay, and we simply have to find these two things. What is the volume of the solute okay and what's the volume of the solution right, you have to get those two correct right 75 milliliter solution so that's going down below right and your solute is that methanol at 3.80 milliliters plug them in multiply times 100 and we have 5.07 percent okay all right, again, it is a ratio between two volumes, so you could use it as a conversion factor if necessary. The textbook has um, a number of different problems using these percent concentrations, so please make sure that you go through the practice problems there and then do some on your own okay, so that you master the concepts. Okay. All right, well, we've been talking about solutions, and we probably should instruct you as to how to make a solution. So how do you prepare a solution in the laboratory? Let's imagine that we want to prepare 100 milliliters of a specific solution. How are you going to go about doing it when you can finally get back into the laboratory? To prepare 100 milliliters of a, a specific type of solution, right? First thing you do, let's imagine we want to make 100 milliliters of a sodium chloride solution, all right? The solute has to be measured out. So you would measure out your sodium chloride, all right, however much of it is required. And then you would dissolve it in just enough solvent to give a final volume of 100 milliliters, okay? just enough. You can't go over, all right? If the solute were dissolved in 100 milliliters of the solvent, so in other words, if you had the solid, okay, in a beaker, right, and then you measured out in your, um, your graduated cylinder uh, exactly 100 milliliters of water, Right. And you poured that 100 milliliters of water into your sodium chloride in the beaker. Right. And you looked at the final volume. The final volume of that solution is liable to be a bit larger or sometimes even smaller than the 100 milliliters. So what's really important is to measure your solute. Okay, So we're talking sodium chloride. Okay, whatever you need, and then take just a little bit of that 100 milliliters, right? Pour it in, stir it around, right? Dissolve it in a minimal amount, and then add in until you come to 100 milliliters, okay? So that's the method that we use for preparing a solution, okay? Another super important solution topic 
is dilution. Dilution, what is it? Well, it's a way that we use as chemists to prepare less concentrated solutions from more concentrated ones. Right? More concentrated solutions it, uh, are ones that have a higher amount of solute in them. Right? Less concentrated means they have less solute in them. Right? So dilution, we can take a concentrated solution and prepare less concentrated solution from it. Huh. So what we're doing in dilution is lowering the concentration by adding additional solvent. All right, so let's go through the procedure of dilution because it's super important to know uh, this procedure. So you have, we said, we're taking a concentrated solution, right? In this procedure, a known number of moles of the substance are transferred to a second container. Right? So let's use some pictures to describe what we're doing. All right, so we have an empty flask here. This is what we're going to make um, our diluted solution in. And we also have a sample here. So this is our concentrated solution, All right? Concentrated. It has a uh, molarity associated with it, right? A particular number of moles of solute have been dissolved in this concentrated solution. We are going to take a certain amount, notice with a pipette, right? Calibrated pipette, we're going to take a certain amount out. And I can't read what that says. My eyes are not that good. All right, but notice what we're doing. We're taking a certain amount out and placing it in. So we know the volume that we took out, okay? We know the molarity. We know how many moles we have of solute in this container. Okay, so a known number of moles of the substance are transferred. All right. Now what are we going to do? We want to dilute it. We want to make it less concentrated. Okay. So how are we going to do that? We are going to add more solvent. Right. By adding more solvent. The same number of moles are still present. However, they're now going to be in a greater volume of solution. Right? So we have a particular number of moles in here. Right? We're not taking any out. They're still in there. We're going to add in solvent. We're going to add in water. Okay, we haven't changed the number of moles. Okay. The only thing we've changed is the volume. We have the same number of moles here as we do here. Okay, let's continue with this notion of dilution. The important thing to remember, as we saw in those pictures on the previous slide, is that in the dilution process, the amount of solute remains constant. We took a particular amount out, placed it in our flask, and we didn't change it, right? Only the volume increased. So the moles before we diluted, we added more solvent, is equal to the moles after dilution. This is important to remember. So let's go back and define moles. Remember, when we're talking solutions, concentration, right? Molarity is equal to the number of moles. Remember, N is um, an abbreviation for moles per liter of solution per volume, right? Moles per volume. 
we can solve for moles, right? Moles is the same before dilution and after dilution. So moles is equal to molarity of your solution times your volume. All right, so let's substitute that in, All right? Moles before dilution, maybe we'll call that one, right? Initial, final, one, two, okay? So, all right, moles before dilution, right, it's going to be equal to the molarity times the volume. So, molarity one, we'll call it, right, times the volume one is going to be equal to moles after dilution. How are we going to specify after? Let's call it two. So, Moles is equal to molarity after dilution, we'll call that 2, times the volume that we have after dilution, volume 2. Okay. This is known as the dilution equation. Okay. Dilution equation. We can take this dilution equation and we can, in fact, generalize it for any of those other concentration units. We don't have to use molarity, although most of the time you're going to see... Uh, molarity use, you could use those percent concentrations in here also. Okay, so concentration before dilution times the volume before dilution is equal to concentration after times the volume after we diluted. All right, so general form. All right, so there's that all important dilution equation that we use. And again, you can generalize it, as we said. Oftentimes, you're going to see it written like this with molarity, but you can generalize. Keep in mind, this is a super important equation. It is very uh, useful in calculating the final concentration of a solution after you have diluted it. Again, in this uh, dilution equation, M1 and V1 refers to the initial concentration and volume of your solution. It's what we took out of that huge concentrated flask. And M2 and V2 refer to the final concentration and the final volume right, after we added more of our water Right, more of our solvent to it. Again, go back and look at our, our pictorial. The final concentration okay, of a diluted solution is going to be equal to the product of your initial concentration right, and what we would call a dilution factor, right? The dilution factor is simply going to be right, M1, V1 divided by V2. Okay, so our, we're, we're asked to calculate that final concentration. Okay, we're simply isolating that variable by bringing over and dividing by the V2. Okay, all right. Practice problem. Okay. Hydrochloric acid, HCl. It's normally purchased at a concentration of 12.0 molar. That is a concentrated solution. Okay. Lots of solute in a little bit of uh, water. What is the final concentration if 100 milliliters of that 12 molar HCl is diluted to 500 milliliters? All right. So we know right off the bat it's a dilution equation. All right. Let's use our general form. Okay. Um, it really doesn't matter which one you use, right? This just tells us could be any concentration, molarity, percent, whatever. Okay, so it's important at this point to pick out who is our C1 and our V1. Okay, um, what we're being asked 
to calculate that we're being asked to calculate the final concentration so keep that in mind so that c2 there is what we want so we are given all these other pieces and you got to make sure you have them right okay so we're solving for c2 let's do it let's pull it on over okay this gives us that dilution factor that we're talking about Again, now we have to go to the problem and identify who's C1, who's V1, who's V2. Okay. All right. So C1, the original, original concentration, they gave it to us, it's 12 molar. Okay. How much of it are, are, are we using, right? If 100 milliliters, we took 100 milliliters, that's the, uh, the volume that we took of that 12 molar. Okay. Right. And we're diluting it to a final volume of 500. So there's our V2. Right. So incredibly important in these problems to identify your C1s, V1s, C2, V2s correctly. OK, take the time. Do your math. And we have 2.40 molar HCl. Notice, always ask, does it make sense? Right. So dilution is my final answer, right, of my diluted solution, less concentrated. Let's look. Well, we started with 12 molar. We're down to 2.4 molar. Yes, that is less concentrated. We did dilute it. Okay. If you got a number bigger than 12, then your math is wrong, right, because that means it's more concentrated. Right. Again, it is super important. We haven't had a lot of math for a while in our previous chapters. This is a super math laden chapter. You need to do the practice problems. You need to be able to do them without using your notes, without using your text, because when you hit the exam or maybe another quiz this weekend on this, um, you got to calculate fast. OK, you can't. It's got to be there. All right. Like clockwork. Okie doke. Let's talk about uh, uh, properties of solution. Let's back away from some of the math and go to conceptual. All right. Properties of solution. Solute particles. Okay. They play a real important role in determining the properties of a solution. The solutions that we have been talking about have small particles, small solute particles like ions, right? Or molecules, glucose solutions, right? Um, physiological saline, right? Body fluids, right? Um, those solutions are transparent. And they do not separate, they cannot be filtered, and they do not scatter light. In the solutions that we've been talking about, right, um, the solute is uniformly dispersed throughout the solvent. In other words, we have a homogeneous mixture sodium chloride solution, potassium bromide solution, right? Um, any of the, the solutions of ionic compounds that we've been talking about, right? Glucose solutions for that matter, okay? Ethanol solutions. When you look at a homogeneous solution, the solute and the solvent can't be distinguished visually. Those are the kinds of solutions that we have been talking about. Why? Because the solute particles, they're ions, they're molecules, right? They are so small. Right? As a matter of fact, they go through filters and through semi-permeable membranes. What's a semi-permeable membrane, you ask? You know what a filter is, right? If we took a sodium chloride solution into the laboratory and tried to and ran it through filter paper, right, which you're all familiar with, 
it'd all go right through, right? The filter paper would not catch any of it. Well, what about a semi-permeable membrane? Well, semi-permeable membranes allow solvent molecules such as water and small solute particles such as ions and molecules, small molecules, to pass right through them. But they do not allow large solute molecules to pass through. So semi-permeable. So let's take a little bit of time and, and just review some things as we move forward because we need to have a firm grasp on, on these concepts. Um, so early in the semester we talked about mixtures, right? And uh, we've been talking about solutions. So let's just review some things. All right. Uh, earlier in the semester when we talked about mixtures, you, you're familiar with heterogeneous mixtures, right? Heterogeneous mixtures different from homogeneous. They are a non-uniform mixture. Remember in them you have regions of different composition. Homogeneous mixtures, we just reviewed it on a previous slide, right? It's, it's a uniform mixture that has the same composition throughout it. Solutions which we have been studying, right, we have said are homogeneous mixtures that contain particles the size of typical ions or small molecules. Well let's introduce a new term, colloids. Colloids are also homogeneous mixtures, but they're different from solutions that contain particles the size of ions or small molecules. Colloids are homogeneous mixtures that contain particles in the range of two to 500 nanometers in diameter. So two to 500 nanometers in diameter is a lot larger than um, an ion or a small molecule. And let's introduce another term Suspensions. Suspensions are heterogeneous mixtures. All right. So remember, these are non-uniform mixtures. Right. So suspension is a heterogeneous mixture that contains um, particles. Okay. So I didn't do a hundred percent well here. Right. There's a word under here that contains particles greater than 500 nanometers. Okay, so let's see if I could come over here and put particles. P A R T I C A L S. Okay, I screwed that one up. Greater than 500 nanometers in diameter. Okay. All right. Let's see where we're going to go with all of this uh, old information and new information. Let's focus on those new ones for a little bit. Suspensions and colloids. Okay. Big thing to remember about them. They're not solutions. Okay. Remember solutions. Small ions or ions and small molecules, right? And they're homogeneous mixtures. Suspensions and colors clearly different. Suspensions, the particles are so large that they in fact settle out of the solvent if they're not constantly stirred or shaken. And colloids, colloids their particle size is intermediate in size between those of a su suspension and those of a solution. So they are, in fact, homogeneous, right? But um, they're going to be different. They're going to have different behavior. So let's start with them. They have the medium size particles, the colloids, right? Uh, intermittent, intermediate between the size of the particles in a solution and those in a suspension. They also cannot be filtered, but they can be separated with a semi-permeable membrane. 
Additionally, they scatter light. They exhibit what's known as the Tyndall effect. What's the Tyndall effect? As we said, colloids scatter light or they exhibit the Tyndall effect. So what that does is it makes a beam of light that you shine through the solution visible. Solutions do not scatter light. So notice um, in the illustration here, the person is holding a pen light, so shining a, uh, a light beam through two solutions. Notice we do not see it at all in the first, okay? But we do pick it up. We do see it in the second, okay? So knowing that colloids scatter light, they make a, a beam visible and solutions do not, right? we can figure out which glass contains the colloid. Right? Does not scatter light, the beam is not visible, that is a solution. Okay, uh, can't filter it, right? And goes right through a semi-permeable membrane also, okay? So here we see the beam of light, so it's exhibiting this Tyndall effect, as we say, and we know then that that's our colloid, right? So if we filter this solution, this colloidal solution, it's gonna go right through the filter paper, but we can use a semi-permeable membrane, okay? As we said earlier, we can separate it, all right? Suspensions. Suspensions, they have very large particles. So large uh, that you can often see them. Remember, they're heterogeneous mixtures. Okay, you're going to see regions that appear to be different. Okay. Their weight, because they're large particles, causes the solute particles to settle out of solution. So you can filter suspensions. Um, but they are very large, right? Very large particles, so they cannot pass through semi-permeable membranes. Because the particles tend to settle out, you must stir or shake them if you want to keep these particles suspended in the suspension. Smog, in fact, is uh, the best example that I could give you of a suspension. But there are plenty of medical suspensions. Okay, some of these you're probably very familiar with. Calamine lotion. Okay, calamine lotion, right? Before you use it, right, you gotta shake it. If you don't shake it, you're gonna get pretty much water. That's it. All right, liquid penicillin is another one. Shake before use. Medical suspensions are always going to say shake well before using. All right. Continuing on with some of these new topics. All right, let's introduce two more. Osmosis and osmotic pressure. If you've taken a biology class, you're probably familiar with that first term, osmosis. Okay, so osmosis is the passage of solvent through a semi-permeable membrane separating two solutions of different concentration. And associated with this process of osmosis is something called osmotic pressure. It's the amount of external pressure applied to the more concentrated solution to halt the passage of solvent molecules across a semi-permeable membrane. So as with all definitions of new terms, you have to internalize them and know exactly what they are in order to be able to apply them in a problem. So we're going to take these new terms and some old terms and we're going to 
continue building our topics. All right. So this osmotic pressure, right? the amount of external pressure applied to the more concentrated solution to halt the passage of solvent molecules across the semi-permeable membrane. What do you have to know about this osmotic pressure? It is produced by the number of solute particles dissolved in a solution, right? Which means if it's produced by the number of solute particles dissolved in a solution, it is going to increase as the number of dissolved particles increase, right? So two words hidden. Not too bad. Let's give a pictorial, all right, of this whole osmosis process. Remember what the definition was. Right? In osmosis, we said right, we have two solutions that are separated by a semi permeable membrane, two solutions of different concentrations. So here we see two different starch solutions, right? 4% starch, 10% starch, right? And they are separated by a semi permeable membrane, the dashed line there, okay? And we learned earlier what a semi-permeable membrane is, right? It's going to allow our solvent, it's going to allow water to move through that membrane, right? So in osmosis, the solvent water is moving through that semi-permeable membrane. So water is going to flow from the side that has the lower solute concentration. Right? It allows the water to go, but not the starch. The starch is too big, right? So the water is going to flow from the lower solute concentration because there's more water over here and less solute into the side with the higher solute concentration. So let's show that, right? The water where we have more of it, right? More water, less solute, less concentrated, right? And it's going to move during the process of osmosis, right? Through the semi-permeable membrane to the side with the higher solute concentration. What's going to happen? Well, that water is going to continue to flow through the semi-permeable membrane until the concentrations of these two solutions become equal. Right. So as the water flowed from one side to the other, right, from our lower concentration to our higher concentration, notice what happened, right? More water, right? Amount of solute stayed the same. So we were diluting the more concentrated starch solution. Well, eventually it gets to a point where they are equal. At that point, the water um, doesn't continue to flow. It goes back and forth. We reach an equilibrium. Some flows up, but some flows in in order to keep the concentrations the same. All right. So that water continues to flow until the concentrations are the same on both sides. All right. Let's throw in some more definitions. Big definition calculation chapter. All right. Osmolarity. Osmol. It is the sum of the molarities of all the dissolved particles in a solution. Okay. Isotonic. If we have an isotonic solution or, or two isotonic solutions, that means they have the same osmolarity. Same concentration. All right. Hypotonic. Hypo means less than, all right? So they have an osmolarity less than the surrounding blood, plasma, or cells, all right? So these terms uh, are used 
um, when we're talking about the body. Okay. Hypertonic. Hyper, right, is a prefix, which means more than. So um, if we have a hypertonic solution, it has a osmolarity, right, a concentration greater than the surrounding blood plasma or cells. So let's take these terms that we've been talking about and let's really apply them to the blood, right? which is a solution. Okay. So cell walls, cell walls we know from our biology act as semi-permeable membranes. The osmotic pressure of blood cells can't change. If that changes, then damage is going to occur to the cells. So we have to have homeostasis, as it's referred to, right? The flow of water between a red blood cell and its surrounding environment has got to be equal, right? Otherwise, the osmotic pressure changes, right? And that's going to cause damage. So what we really have to have, right, are these things called isotonic solutions, right, in the body, isotonic solutions. They're going to be solutions that exert the same osmotic pressure as the red blood cells. They're going to have the same osmolarity, right? as the red blood cells. So medically speaking, 5% glucose is something that's administered in the hospital or that 0.90%, that physiological saline, right, sodium chloride, they, um, they are used because their solute concentrations provide an osmotic pressure that is equal to that of the red blood cells, right? They have the same osmolarity as the red blood cells, the same osmotic pressure. And we're not going to get water going in and out of the cells, okay? For instance, let's imagine a red blood cell, right? Red blood cell has a certain amount of water in it, right? With dissolved ions, molecules, etc. Physiological saline, okay? Or I mean, water can go in or out of the solution, right? Or I mean, out of the red blood cell. Let's back up here. This is our red blood cell with water, right? Okay. When we have 5% glucose, 0.9% sodium chloride, right, which are medically used. They're used because um, their osmolarity is the same as what's going on in that red blood cell. So we're at that equilibrium. In other words, water, yes, will flow out of the red blood cell, but it'll also flow in at the same rate. So it's an equilibrium Right. They're going to exert the same osmotic pressure as the red blood cells. It was like uh, after all the water went from our less concentrated solution to our more concentrated solution to bring the concentrations the same. Okay. All right. So the, in the previous, in an isotonic solution, our red blood cell is happy. All right. It's at equilibrium. So those hypotonic solutions that we talked about, right? they have an, a lower osmotic pressure than the red blood cells. Right, so let's put everything together. Okay. Lower osmotic pressure, right? That means they're going to have a lower concentration of particles right, than the red blood cell has. In a hypotonic solution, a red blood cell, right, water 
is going to flow into the red blood cell right because the red blood cell is going to have the higher concentration here's our red blood cell okay we're placing this red blood cell in a hypotonic solution right lower concentration than what's going on in this red blood cell remember how osmosis occurs right cell membrane semi-permeable membrane water's gonna come right from where lower concentration to higher concentration so water in our hypotonic solution is going to flow in to that cell from or through the semi-permeable membrane what's going to happen as water flows into that red blood cell it's going to grow in size it's going to swell all right swelling of a red blood cell is termed hemolysis okay if too much hemolysis happens then that red blood cell is likely to burst and that's not a good thing okay we need our red blood cells all right. All right. Well, let's look at the effect that a hypertonic solution is going to have on a red blood cell. Remember, isotonic is the best thing, right? Same, same osmolarity. Okay. Hypertonic. Okay. That means that this type of solution is a higher osmotic pressure than the red blood cell. Higher osmotic pressure, what does that mean? Has a higher particle concentration. Okay. What's going to happen in a hypertonic solution? How does osmosis occur? Right. Water flows from the lower concentration to the higher concentration the lower concentration is now in the red blood cell outside the hypertonic solution has the higher concentration so water is going to flow out of the red blood cell as it flows out of the red blood cell that red blood cell is going to shrink when a red blood cell shrinks, it's known as crenation. All right. I hope you enjoyed my, my pictures uh, of red blood cells. Let's look at some actual red blood cells. That's what these are here. Um, red blood cells and how they look in isotonic all right, solutions. Okay. A- it's a normal red blood cell okay in an isotonic solution of 0 0.30 osmol right uh, the red blood cells normal in appearance okay the second one B our red blood cells have been put in a hypotonic solution if you compare them they're swollen because of the water gain and if they swell too much, they might burst, right? This is a process known, as we said, hemolysis. And the very last one there, uh, those red blood cells in C, right? They have been put into a hypertonic solution. And notice what's happening. They're beginning to shrivel as they lose water. This is a process known as crenation. Okay. All right. So we're on to our very last topic in this chapter. It's known as dialysis. Dialysis is a process that's similar to osmosis. The pores in a dialysis membrane are larger than those in an osmotic membrane, a semi-permeable membrane. so if they're larger that means that both solvent molecules and small solute particles can pass 
through a dialysis membrane. The only thing that can't are large colloidal as well as proteins, right? Large colloids and proteins cannot pass through. So dialysis, similar to osmosis, right? Remember osmosis um, involves a semi-permeable membrane, okay? Only difference between an, a dialysis membrane and an osmosis membrane, a semi-permeable one, is that both your solvent molecules, right, and small solute particles can get through. Large colloids cannot, as well as proteins, correct? Right? So dialysis is used um, to filter blood, right, for those people who have kidney damage, right, hemodialysis, it is referred to as, it's used to cleanse the blood of patients whose kidneys um, have malfunctioned. In hemodialysis, the blood is diverted from the body and pumped through a long cellophane dialysis tube. That dialysis tube is suspended in an isotonic solution. Okay, so it's going to have the same osmolarity as the red blood cells, right? And it is formulated in order to contain many of the same components as blood plasma has. So here we have an illustration of what happens, okay? So um, it is set up like this hemodialysis, right? Takes blood from the artery through a pump, right? And here we see our semi-permeable membrane that's put in this dialysis solution that is an isotonic solution formulated to be similar to the blood plasma, right? Okay. And so in here, remember, things are going to be able to pass through. So small waste materials, such as urea, which the kidneys can't uh, remove, right, pass through this dialysis membrane from the blood to the solution where they're simply, notice, solution comes in and then it's washed out. So it's continually refreshed, okay? Um, so we're removing things that the body cannot remove themselves, small waste materials um, through this dialysis membrane. And then it's placed through a filter and back in. So this uh, hemodialysis machine ends up doing what the body cannot do. All right, so this ends our discussion for week nine and chapter nine on solutions.